So it's 11.01 and um, maybe we can go ahead and get started. Is that okay, Leanne and, and Chris and Charlotte? Sounds great. Yes. Punctuality is good. Hi everyone, I'm Cheryl Kamehanan. Welcome to our virtual Excel Academy. I'm really excited that you have chosen to join us today. It is, we started out with the registration at 121 as of this morning, we are now up to 170 plus. And of those 170, 143 and counting are jumping on board. So we're really excited you've chosen to spend an hour of your day with us today. Uh, I am Cheryl Kamehanan. I am a professor at Cal State University, Los Angeles. And Excel Academy is very dear to my heart. It's actually the name of what we call our learning center where we bring on board anywhere between 30 students to 40 students on campus every Saturday. That has quickly evolved. I don't know if we're gonna be able to offer it this fall as things are unfolding folding very rapidly. So we've gone virtual. And um, now what I have um, hoped to do is allow this virtual programming to go nationwide. So with the help of Charlotte and Leanne who have now taken on the lead of this wonderful program, we have been able to offer you this one hour of programming. So let me take a moment to introduce Leanne and Charlotte. Leanne is from APH and um, she has taken on the lead as setting up the Zoom. If you have any technical issues or technical difficulties with Zoom, your questions should be directed to Leanne for that support and for that help. But as seeing that we are now at 159 participants, we've had a lot of success with you all logging in. So thank you for joining us that way. I'll give Leanne a moment to quickly introduce herself. Hi, I'm Leanne Grillot. I am the National Director of Outreach Services for the American Printing House for the Blind. Our goal is to work on getting professional development out to teachers, but with this avenue, we're able to get some learning out for our students who utilize the materials that we work so hard to get out to them. Uh, welcome, and we hope to see you when the topic matches your students. If you do have any technical questions, you're welcome to send them to me. The email that you received comes from me and you have that email contact as well. If the question is something I cannot answer and it needs to go to one of the uh, presenters, I will work on getting that information to them. And we're working very hard to get all of these recorded so that information can be shared because we know not everybody has this time period available to them. And shall I turn it over to Charlotte? Hi everyone, uh, my name is Charlotte Cushman. I work for Perkins School for the Blind and Texas School for the Blind and Visually Impaired, uh, managing the Paths to Literacy website. Um, I, as you may have heard if you logged on early, we're busy adding lots of sessions. Um, today is our first session, which we're very excited about, but uh, the schedule is evolving quickly as we find different presenters. So our hope is to have something for everyone, as many uh, different types of sessions for as many different learners as we can. So thanks so much for joining us today. All right, thank you, Charlotte, and thank you for Leanne for introducing yourself. And um, I also want to introduce our instructor of the day, Chris Tapp, comes to us from Maryland School for the Blind. He is an orientation and mobility expert, and he has been wonderful enough to step up and be the first one to run a lesson on, on our virtual Excel. Well, thank you very much, uh, Cheryl and everyone. Um, I, I'm thinking now that the uh, topic of the presentation, problem solving, could be very appropriate for today. Hopefully, uh, if we have any problems, we can figure them out together. And this is a terrific opportunity that Leanne and Cheryl and Charlotte have all worked very hard on putting together so that we have uh, a new learning channel for our students, especially while outside of schools. Um, and so thank you everyone for being able to take some time to be here so that we can uh, continue learning even while we're uh, experiencing closures. Thank you. And so before we get started, I just want to take about three minutes to give you a few general tips about using Zoom. First of all, for when you log in, you will all be automatically muted and your video cameras are turned off. We do that for confidentiality purposes, and so I want to share with you a quick disclaimer, and that is to say that 
if you are using your camera or if you are choosing to speak auditorily, number one, we are recording this session. And so your identifications will no longer be confidential because we'll be able to see your face if you have the video camera on, or we'll be able to hear your voice if you use the audio. And so for that reason, we are muting everybody and also keeping the video cameras off. And if you choose to use it, we will give you that uh, option to use it. However, we just need you to know that when you do do that, we will be able to see your face, we will be able to hear your voice, and therefore your confidentiality has been lost, and that we are so also will be recording this and publicizing it, hopefully archiving it and allowing it to be out there for the public. And so just know that if you do uh, choose to use your video or your audio. The second thing is, how do you let us know you want to say something? Well, you can use your chat window. And so if you are using a mouse and you are a visual user, if you take your mouse and scroll over the panel bar at the bottom, there will be several different controls that pop up. One of them will be a chat. Visually, you will see a speech bubble that is blank and the word chat underneath it. And you can press on that and a chat window will pop up on your right hand side of your screen. Once that chat window pops up, you will see everyone's comments and those also will be recorded. And so you might wanna self monitor some of those comments because if it does pop up, it might be part of the recording. If you are a, a keyboard user, then one way you can get into it is by using an Alt H, Alt H. If you are a Mac user, the command is Command Shift H and that should bring up your chat window. We ask that you use this chat window for any questions and you can go ahead and type right in there. If you wanna just say hello for right now, then you can say hello and we'll all be able to see you typing. There are different ways to choose the person who receives it. Right now it is set to all panelists and attendees. You can choose to just send it to one person or you could choose to send it only to the panelists. It, but to do that, you click on the message that says two and um, the names will pop up and you'll be able to navigate it that way. All right, I see a lot of people populating the chat windows with hi and hello. Uh, we will be constantly monitoring that and Chris has assured us that there are moments built in already into the presentation where we'll be able to allow you to speak and participate and use that chat feature. If you would like to use your microphone, you can also let us know in the chat window that you would like to say something and um, we'll be able to, to do that that way. There is a way to raise your hand. Um, if you mouse over uh, the, the screen where it says more, oh, I know how you do it. Sorry, took a moment. You click on panelists. So again, if you go down to the bottom of your screen where the panel is, you click on panelists and there will be a list of right now your name and the presenters. Again, we've restricted it. We now have 192 attendees, but we don't see all 192 names. What we see are the panelists names and your name. If you mouse over your, your name, you will see the option to be able to raise your hand uh, in the bottom part of the screen where it says mute, uh, unmute, and more. There is a feature to raise your hand or unraise your hand. And so you can play around with that if you want to. Probably for now, as we're kind of getting started and used to this, the chat feature would probably be the best way to, to get in touch with us. If you do speak, um, please remember to state your name when you speak so we know who you are when you're making a comment. And um, lastly, again, Cheryl, Charlotte, and uh, Leanne will be monitoring that chat window to allow you to speak. So that's it for announcements for me, and I don't want to delay any longer to letting Chris get started with his lesson. This is Charlotte. I have one more quick announcement, a question that came in while you were talking, Cheryl. Someone was wondering if you have to be 18 to attend this because they had thought it was for K through 12. And we just wanted to clarify that you have to be 18 in order to register. So 
um, if you have a parent or a caregiver or someone who's there with you who is over 18, that's what we're hoping for. Um, but with the content is indeed for students. So take it away, Chris. Okay, thank you, everyone. Um, and, and as Charlotte said, uh, the, the content here is part of what we're learning today. And uh, we haven't done any polling yet, but maybe we can do that um, uh, along the way. It's sometimes when presenting, you want to have an idea of what the uh, audience is. You want to know your audience. And, and in this case, we don't really know the audience because I, I'm not able to just check in with everyone as though we were all in one setting. So if uh, you all see a poll on your screen, um, if you could just include whether you're, uh, what, what grade you are, if you're an adult um, that's either uh, a family member or a teacher um, or some other uh, person that's there helping, that would be great. It helps us to kind of know how to present the information. The information is geared toward everyone from elementary school to, uh, let's say, uh, 22. And so our transition age students, and hopefully there will be some things in here that everyone finds helpful. There will likely be things that you already know and appreciate your patience as we work through those. And there, there may be some things that, uh, well, hopefully will be some things that you learn as we go along. Um, if there are things that you have to share with those that are attending, please do so in the chat room, either by uh, adding additional suggestions. If you know of something when, for instance, if we're talking about applications, if you know of an app that you like to use, please share that. Um, if you have questions, please do contribute because if you have that question, it's likely other people do as well. And it really helps to make the presentation more engaging rather than just hearing um, a monotone uh, monologue the whole time. So we'll go ahead and get started with kind of looking at the poll a little bit here. Um, just to describe what's on the screen, uh, the first question is, I am select all that apply. We've got the largest number of a teacher or other vision professional at 72%, about 20% students, about 14% student with a visual impairment, and about 5% that are indicating other. Uh, the second question, I am a student, I am or the student I am assisting, uh, birth to five, 3%, grades one through five, 22%, grades 6 through 9, 15%, grades 10 through 12, 13%, adult students, 6%, and adult participants, 40%. So most of, most of those attending appear to be adults um, and uh, teachers, and we do have a good mixture of different ages with students, and so we'll try to have some content that's appropriate for everyone. It's really encouraged, again, for people to participate. We're still learning how the the timing of this will flow and how many slides we'll get through. Whatever we don't get through today, we can uh, share in different ways, uh, but we'll go ahead. I'm gonna um, just wait another moment on the poll here. It looks like we've got quite a few. I guess we're, we're gonna, I'm gonna click share the results so that everybody can see that. Um, and uh, if those are, if anyone is curious, that's basically our, the results of our uh, poll so far. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna start sharing from my screen on my computer. And hopefully you all will see a PowerPoint presentation popping up. And we're just gonna go through this PowerPoint presentation. And I'm gonna go ahead and, uh, let's see, rearrange my screen a little bit uh, so that I can see what everybody else is seeing as well. Um, if you need to pause along the way for questions, if I talk too fast, um, if you'd like more information, please do indicate that in the chat so that we can make sure that um, the co-hosts, uh, the host co-hosts can, can share that. I, I won't be looking at the chat screen myself. I'll just be previewing the slides and things as we move along here. So today's session is problem solving skills. Um, and just again, a, a brief thank you for everyone for being here today so that we can all work on new ways of learning. The problem solving skills, ways to develop problem solving skills that you can use now and throughout your life. Um, let's see here. We're gonna start with a joke. Sorry, I, I um, really like uh, corny humor. And when I get nervous as I am today, I sometimes forget. So we put one in the slides. So what are the best kind of jokes during school closures from a virus? I'll give you all a moment to think about that. Um, the nice thing about doing a broadcast and a webinar is that I don't have to hear everyone groan <clears throat> when I tell the answer. So here we go. They are inside jokes, best kind of jokes 
uh, when we have to be uh, isolated is an inside joke. So um, regarding our problem solving, let's begin with describing the obvious. What are problems? Uh, those are surprises when the unexpected happens, but they are not the type of surprises you would like to have, such as surprise presence. We've all got some surprises that occur in our days. It could be a surprise party. It could be that um, on our way somewhere, they're, they're all green lights. Those are wonderful surprises. Sometimes we get other surprises, like um, we didn't put the cap correctly on our water bottle and now everything inside mm -hmm. is soaked. What do we do in that case? Lots of different things that can occur unexpectedly throughout our day. Problems are the type of surprises that seem to make us feel we are stuck or overwhelmed when we don't know what to do next. Problems might include, my cane broke, I'm lost. I was using my phone for directions and it died. Problems can of, often make us feel uneasy, worried, frightened. What kinds of problems have you experienced in life? And I'm hoping here that um, whoever's participating, whether it's teachers, students, adults, that we can all share a little bit about some of the problems that occur so that we can share uh, with the students that are participating some types of problems that they might encounter in their life. There'll be some that are more appropriate for our high school students, some that are more appropriate for our early uh, elementary learners and, and lots of things in between. So I'm gonna pause for a moment and maybe <clears throat> some problems can be typed into the chat and maybe our, our co-hosts can, uh, can share those out for us. So the first one I've seen, this is Leanne, comes from Kimberly says, no toilet paper. Oh my or, goodness, yes. That's a real current day problem, but it could really happen at any time, which is uh, the reality of life, but certainly more so today. The next one, my favorite teacher leaving the school. Oh, that can be very frustrating, especially when we have those close relationships. Definitely. I burnt supper. It's, <laughs> there's, it's always nice to have options when those things occur. Okay, thank Chris, you. For you just, Chris, there are, there are a lot about that we're all suffering from with uh, related to coronavirus and the closures, but a particular O&M one I wanted to read is from Nikita Smith. Uh, my cane broke while I was riding the bus one day. Uh, Lisa uh, Gioria, sorry if I mispronounced that, Lisa, not knowing how to use the technology everybody else knows how to use. Um, we have another question. I was teaching an O&M lesson and it started raining hard on me and my student. We were three blocks from school. Uh, again, I'm skipping over things that are general and not O&M specific. No access to Uber and I don't want my parents to drive me. Got on the wrong train. Um, struggling with braille technology. Um, not being able to find toys when I can't see them. Some of my TV shows are not audio described. Um, my stuff that's not in its place. Uh, not getting to go on spring break, being stuck inside, flat tire on the way to see a student. So there are more than that, but that yeah, should be able to um, you. <laughs> get you hopefully, started. Hopefully, um, maybe we can, after the presentation, be able to, uh, I would love to see the chat transcript if possible. That'd be yeah, great. Absolutely. These we'll are, save it are, in. We'll save it and address any other questions. These are terrific opportunities for lessons. Um, thank you everyone for sharing. And now that we're all in the mindset of um, having problems um, and being able to, to just share about what they are, we can kind of move into uh, some, some solution modes. But first we're gonna, we're gonna look a little bit more about um, what, where problems come from, how our problem solving develops, and then move into some uh, practical applications that we can do. So the good news is problems can be solved. Things can turn out better than we ever imagined. What is problem solving? Problem solving is a process that can help you think clearly so you can solve the challenge at hand. Where does problem solving ability come from? And, I, and I'm gonna pause there for a moment. I'm hoping that folks can share where you think problem solving comes from to see if uh, before, I, before I offer up my, my perspective or opinion, see if anybody has ideas of where problem solving comes from. Where do we get it from? 
here's some ideas in the chat box, Chris. Uh, practice, experiences, attitude, a list of pros and cons. A lot of people are writing in real life experiences. Uh, trial and error, childhood, failing, lots of practice. Your brain, observing how other people have solved problems, structured opportunities to practice, modeling, using your toolbox. The, the answers are coming in. There's so oh many goodness. good ones. <laughs> terrific. These are great answers. Thank you, everyone, for participating. It makes it so much, so much more engaging and enjoyable. Um, we all, as, as humans, are going to experience problems, and we all have skill at problem solving, and, and we can definitely learn from each other. Thank you, everyone. Believe it or not, problem solving started before you could even talk. It begins seemingly... Uh, as seemingly random movements that cause accidental encounters. And I'll just put a little side note in here for Miss Charlotte, who is very much uh, a, an expert in the area of um, active learning. And so when, when we are infants, we're in that process of active learning. And by some of our simple movements, uh, we can cause things to change or things to happen. And we discover cause and effect. We discover that we can have impact on something else and bring about things that we like and sometimes things that we don't like just by our movements or our actions. Um, I'm just going to play a little video. I'm going to describe what happens in the video um, and then I'll play the video. There's a, a, a very young person here, an infant who's on the floor seeming to be interested in one, one thing on the ground. I think it's just a, like a teething toy and uh, then notices something different in their world and wants to go to it but doesn't quite know how to move their body to do that. Then by an accident, the infant's body rolls over and all of a sudden they're presented with something to do, a new toy, and it brings them to a point of smiling and being happy. But it wasn't necessarily an intentional movement, a planned out motor coordination, like deciding you would like to do a somersault or a backward roll, it just happens. So I'm gonna go ahead and play this video. It doesn't have any sound to it. It's just a video, but we see the infant here uh, playing with the teething toy and then moving their body a little bit, noticing, oh, there's something there. And as they notice, their body accidentally rolls over and now the toy is directly in front of them. They happen to lift their leg, which activates the toy. And by that toy activating, it brings them some sounds and ultimately brings them to a smile. So lots of things in life can just happen. Play in its many forms is a terrific way to learn to solve challenges. Uh, that might be, we're, we're playing with the ball and the ball gets stuck in the net. Now what do we do? That, that can be a problem, but it's a problem that we can solve. Sometimes though, we're in places where we are not playing. What then? Those are gonna be the situations like people talked about before with some of our problems, such as not having toilet paper. You might find yourself um, really needing some of those things and not having them. What do we do? Some problems are preventable. So, we're going to talk a little bit about preventing problems, but before we do, does anybody have any questions at the moment uh, about how things are going? Or does anybody have any ideas about what types of problems might be preventable? And we'll pause for a minute. You can go ahead and type in the chat box if you have any ideas about what problems might be preventable. So you're asking what types of problems, Chris? We're, so we have people, uh, someone well, has said I'm, broken stuff. Broken stuff, sometimes things break and we're, by the way we, by the way we use it, we're able to prevent a problem from happening. Um, there are certain, certain activities that we can do in a certain way that prevent things. So um, let's say uh, there are some rules about being around a pool. Many times people will say no running or no horseplay. What types of problems might that prevent? Um, We've got a bunch of ideas here coming in, Chris. I'm going to read you oh, some great. more. Uh, you. Use your cane and it will help you not run into things. Um, you could prevent running out of toilet paper by buying it. Uh, getting lost while rock walking a route. Falling. The ones you've had before and figured out how to solve it for the next time. Uh, preparation, so you have the things you need for an outing. Um, you could prevent things by anticipating what might happen next. Clear up the area. 
there, there are a lot of ideas. And if I don't read your idea, please know that we're going to save all these ideas. We just have more than we have time to read. So go ahead, Chris. Thank you. Thank you, Charlotte, so much for helping with this. And thank you, everyone, for participating. Um, a pre-flight checklist uh, helps pilots and other aircraft professionals avoid problems by making sure they check key points before the plane goes in the air, addressing problems before they become serious. A pre-flight checklist likely came about because problems did occur and a process was created to solve and prevent them in the future. So sometimes the things that we use to prevent problems from occurring, actually those strategies that we use to prevent them came from the problem occurring once and then us trying to find a way to not have it happen again. You might even develop your own pre-flight checklist for your day. What might you include? And, and this again is another opportunity for everyone to think about if just like a plane taking off before the plane goes in the air, there are certain things that it needs. They probably want to make sure that the toilets are emptied before the next flight goes. They probably want to make sure there's toilet paper in the bathroom, that there's fuel in the engine, that all the doors are locked. What types of things might you include in your pre-flight checklist? The answers might be different for every age of student, every adult, each one of us, uh, but maybe you could share some of those in the chat. Uh, here are some answers uh, or ideas. Checking the weather, plugging in your device before it runs out of uh, juice, eating so you don't get hungry, um, figuring out if you're dressed appropriately for the weather, wearing comfortable clothing, I like that one, uh, packing your night backpack the night before, um, again, making sure your laptop is charged so it doesn't die. Uh, reviewing your calendar. So that's a bit of a, a little snapshot of some of the ideas that came in. That's, that's terrific. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you, everyone. So here's an example checklist. Um, you might put a note by the door, just like um, they, they might use a clipboard for the plane. The note might include things like your house key, a purse, a wallet water bottle, backpack, a lunch or a snack, clothing for the weather of the day or um, many forms of weather that might occur throughout the day. These are types of things that if uh, sometimes I might find that I, I get to work and I've forgotten one thing or the other. This is a way before I leave the house to prevent that problem from occurring so that I don't have to go hungry for the day because I forgot my lunch. I've used my pre-flight checklist to make sure I had everything I need to be organized to head out on my day. Problem solved. If problems do arise, you can use a system of steps to help you resolve the challenges. So we're going to go through uh, just some steps. There's lots of different ways that people problem solve. This is just one possibility. So let's look at a list of things to do when solving problems. Number one, stay calm. By the way, I'm probably going to ask some questions along the way regarding some of these points. So try to, try to think about the why. Why would I want to stay calm? Number two, identify the problem. Number three, generate options of what can be done. Number four, consider each option you generated and choose the one that seems best. Number five, try that option out. And number six, evaluate your success. Did it work to solve the problem or do you have to try one of the other ideas generated? So let's talk a little bit about why staying calm is so important. It allows generating creative options, allows us to be aware of resources that are available to help us, allows us to judge clearly without thinking and acting out of fear. Can anyone think of other reasons that staying calm is important? We're just Get waiting calm. for people to type some ideas in the chat box, Chris. Awesome. Thank you so much, Charlotte. It helps others to stay calm. That's a very good point, yes. Calm and is if, contagious. If adults are uh, able to stay calm, whether you're a parent or a teacher, it helps the students to feel calm. Uh, you don't rush the pro process and make a bad decision. You can focus better, helps us think more clearly. We won't make mistakes. Uh, it allows us to make rational choices, helps us to communicate well, so that's a bit. Very good, very good. Everybody's thinking, that's, that's terrific. Some problems are easy, some are much more challenging. 
We've got all different kinds of problems. Let's start with an easy one. So we're going to do an activity, and um, there's going to be some, some commotion and chaos on the computer screen here because I'm going to jump from this PowerPoint slide and connect my smartphone, uh, which today I'm using an iPhone. I'm going to connect my smartphone to the screen so that everyone can see the use of an app. I'm going to be using Seeing AI, which is an app from Microsoft. It is free. I believe at the moment it's only available for the iPhone, but there are other artificial or AI intelligence apps that, that uh, we're going to talk about that are available on both platforms. Um, so if you'll be patient for just a moment, I'm going to try to end the show uh, and do a new share. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Uh, you probably have a picture of me at the moment. I'm going to try to uh, connect my phone. Uh, let's see, I'm going to try to share another screen. Chris, while you're working on that, I'm going to read a few more ideas that have popped in. Oh, well, that's terrific. Um, Thank you. Uh, another idea that people had about why it's important to stay calm is it's better for your health. Um, it, uh, it also gives us a higher chance of solving the problem. And you may be overthinking if you do not stay calm. So the, the best solution may be more obvious if you're able to be calm. Well, Chris is just now uh, getting his iPhone all hooked up. So thank you everyone for being patient. And I just want to thank all of you for uh, who's for typing in the chat window. There are a lot of great responses coming in and we'll collect those so you can have a, have a look at them later. Okay, hopefully at the moment, everyone is seeing an image of the home screen of my iPhone. Yes, and we are, Chris. Thank you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to launch an app called Seeing AI. And I apologize, I have a ridiculously large number of apps on my phone. So um, the Seeing AI app is, I'm going to try to circle it with a mouse here. Um, it is in the top right corner. And that's what the app icon looks like. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to launch that app. And we'll talk about Short it. Short piece at 1908. Ilaki piece 100% fresh. For a second, sorry. Um, at the moment, I have uh, the app launched, and uh, it has a camera view. And there happens to be two cans of food in front of me. If I were um, not able to visually detect those, I'm just going to turn them around for a moment so that they won't say their labels. It will just be the backs of the cans. If I didn't have the visual ability to read those, they're going to feel identical. I won't know which one is which. I won't know which one is the tomato sauce and, and which one is the, the black eyed peas, I believe. Um, so by using an app, it can help me to solve this problem. There might not be anyone around to ask, so I can use this app to help me. On the bottom of the app screen, at the moment, the illuminated icon is short text. The next one is document. The next one is product, and it shows a barcode. By choosing that, product, it will be looking for a barcode. Processing, Bush's best blocky peas. And then I can do the same with the next one. I'm going to go back, and by just rotating the can in front of the camera, process, it automatically with finds basil, the garlic barcode and oregano, form. Roma tomatoes, basil, garlic and oregano. So now I've solved that problem where I didn't know when I'm making spaghetti sauce, it could turn out rather interesting if I add my black eyed peas thinking it's tomato sauce. So by using an app, it's helped me to be independent to solve that problem. Now I'm going to try to jump back to um, our presentation screen, see if anyone has any questions uh, regarding the use of that app. There are lots of different ways to use it, which we'll talk about, uh, let's see. Um, Chris, maybe while we have this pause, Leanne, do you want to let Veronica ask her question? She's had her hand up and we want to be sure she's able to ask the question that she's been wanting to ask. Okay, Veronica, your microphone should be um, unmuted, so you will need to turn it on to say something.
And this okay. is Char Oh, you go ahead, Veronica. Sorry. Um, so what I was going to say is that my, as an idea, my preference for an app um, would be Be My Eyes. I have tried seeing AI, but for some weird reason, um, I've had a lot of difficulty trying that. It doesn't it doesn't identify items um, very well, so. And, and thank you very much, Veronica. I'm so glad that you said that because coming up on the next couple of screens, we're gonna talk about, we're gonna talk about that exact app. And maybe when we do, um, you've already shared a little bit, maybe you can also share either through the, the chat or, or through um, voice, sharing um, some of the ways that you use that app. Chris, before um, we let you go on, we have a question which I wanted to uh, bring up here is what else can the app do? Is that what you're going to be talking about next? It, it most certainly is. Okay. Thank, well, you well, for, thank you all for keeping me moving forward. I okay. sure appreciate it. The, the next screen happens to be, this is just a, a screenshot of the web page for seeing AI. Um, and you can just do a Google search uh, or any uh, search engine for seeing AI Microsoft and it will bring up the web page. But this shows just some examples of what the app can do. Um, I'm just going to read some of these. It says uh, it can do short text, which basically anything that I hold the camera in front of that has words, it will read the text. It can read an entire document. So let's say that my teacher gives me a PDF document about the history of the United States. It could read the entire document for me basically taking uh, text and turning it into speech. We can do uh, the product recognition as we just showed with the barcode. It's something that with some simple, simple practice of turning a package, whether it's a can or a box, basically it's like using self-checkout at the grocery store. As you turn the package, eventually the barcode reader from the cash register will find that barcode the same is true with a camera on your smartphone. You can also have it identify people. It can tell you um, basically by taking a picture of that person, some general information such as, is this a, a, a boy or a girl? Is this uh, an older person, a younger person? It might tell you if they're happy or if they're sad just by the expression on their face. It can take a picture of a scene and describe what some of the things that are there, such as trees, or in this image that is a person throwing a Frisbee, you can also import a photograph that's in your camera roll so we can describe what's there. So sometimes your problem is, I want to send a picture to my parents about what we did on our field trip, but I don't know which one is the right picture. You can use this app to describe what pictures you have in your camera roll. So when you get to the one of you standing next to the horse or wherever you were visiting, that's the one that you can send to your parents. The app can also identify denominations of money. So you can hold a $1 bill up in front of the camera or a $10 bill or a $20 bill, and it will tell you what denomination of bill that you have so that you can fold them appropriately to put in your wallet to keep them organized. There's lots of different things that these apps can do, and they're adding more things every day. There's a color identifier. There's a light detector. Many, many things that are possible with these apps. And Chris, we have a couple of uh, questions and comments sure. uh, while you pause there. Um, people want to know, is it free? It is F-R-E-E. -E. It is a wonderful price. It is free. Many of our uh, large tech companies uh, are producing these apps um, for free, which is a wonderful thing. Um, many people use these apps in different ways. They're very helpful in lots of different scenarios. It helps uh, to develop these systems of artificial intelligence. It's kind of a win-win situation for everyone. Google has one that's called Google Lookout, I believe. Uh, the challenge at the moment with Google Lookout is that you need to have a very modern phone to be able to use some of that technology. So I don't know that Lookout will run on every Android phone. There's another app that's called Envision AI that does uh, function on both iOS platforms as well as the Android platform from the Google Play Store, but that one does have a cost associated with it. It's kind of a free to begin with, but then there's some in-app purchases. So uh, there are lots of different ways of getting information. This is just one that happens to be absolutely free. 
Thank you, Chris. And one other comment was that it, uh, someone's of the opinion that it's not very good at identifying people. Well, and, and you can teach it people to recognize people. There are different apps that perform better at different activities. Um, that can be a, a one presentation all in itself. And maybe at some <laughs> point that, that will be a presentation. Um, I, I, I don't know that there is any one best app for everyone. It's just nice to have choices like we have, um, say, regular milk, chocolate milk, and strawberry milk. Everybody has something they like. And then we also have people with dietary concerns who need uh, non-dairy milk. We've got lots of options in the world. There isn't one best. It's just what works best for you in any given situation. Um, Thank you, Chris. One other question that's coming up is people want a clarification. Is this just for iPhones? Is there anything uh, for the Android? So again, I'm, I'm going to jump to the next screen here. Um, it says uh, there are other options for AI, artificial intelligence apps, and for crowdsourced or remote assistance too. And then our next screen gives us a list. So I'm sorry for jumping ahead here, but this will help uh, to keep everyone uh, hopefully on the same page. The Envision AI runs on both platforms. The one we were looking at, the Seeing AI, only at the moment, only runs on iPhone. Tap Tap C is available on both platforms. It works a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. You take a picture and it comes back with an answer of what it is. So if I took a picture of that can, somebody could describe to me that it was uh, indeed either black eyed peas or tomato soup, um, or excuse me, tomato sauce. Uh, the Be My Eyes app, which Veronica had mentioned before, is an app that is crowdsourced, where basically we have volunteers who are looking at the picture and helping you with it. So you create a live video connection between you and a volunteer, and whatever that volunteer would uh, sees, they can relay to you. So it might be that I'm looking at uh, photographs and I want to know which one is the photograph of my dog. I can show those in front of this phone's camera and the volunteer can help me to find the one that's a picture of my dog. It could be that I'm looking for the um, expiration date on the food that I'm eating, the volunteer can help find the expiration date on the package, tell me which way to turn the package to be able to find that. So it's basically a team working together. Similarly, as we're doing today, using Zoom as our video conference, we're working together through this video connection. Another one that is crowdsourced is called Be Specular. This one doesn't have a live video feed. It's more of a, you take a picture of something and send that picture along with your question. So it might be that I send a picture of a letter and my question might be, could you tell me who this letter is from? So that the person answering the question knows specifically what information I want from the photograph that I've sent. Some people feel more comfortable with that than doing an actual live video because you have control over what the volunteer is seeing at a different level. So There's while you're taking a pause there, we have a question from Madeline, and she has her hand raised. Okay. Madeline, go ahead. You can unmute yourself. Or Leanne will unmute you. Yeah. Madeline, you can speak. I've turned on your mic. Okay, if we don't have Madeline there, let's go ahead with Veronica's question. Veronica? Um, so I have had um, a lot of success with Be My Eyes, um, but the only time that I have actually had success with um, seeing AI was when I was in Houston, Texas with my uncle this past summer, and he was able to somehow I have no idea hold the camera over um, a sign with some history about a park that we were in and it described and it read um, the document and it described the scenery quite like in a lot of detail which made it really easy for me to understand but after that it just rolled downhill completely didn't work. Well, thank, thank you for sharing what was positive, Veronica, as well as your frustrations. 
sometimes working <laughs> with your, um, uh, I, I'm going to start with orientation mobility specialist because that just happens to be what profession uh, I'm, I'm specialized in. You can work with your O&M specialist, your teacher of the visually impaired, your parent, your uncle, to practice some of those things. There is some problem solving that goes into just using the app that helps us with the problems. One of the things that can be very challenging for many students is how far away from the camera do I hold the product? And it just takes some practice. So just like that little baby that we saw playing on the floor that was trying to get to its toy in the little video, it takes some just playing and practice to see what we can get it to do. So maybe one day you sit down with, let's say, five or 10 different items from the grocery store. It might be a box of tissues and a box of cereal and a can of soup and some other things to just see if you can try each type of package to find the barcode. Mm -hmm. those, those kind of games, and it might even be a contest between you and someone else to see who can get the most barcodes, right? Can yeah. make it fun to learn so that you can, when you do need to do that in a maybe a more stressful situation, like you're in a hurry to make a recipe before you have to have company over, maybe that would be a way to get really talented with using it. So where are most barcodes located on products? They can be on a box, they can be on the top, they can be on the bottom, they can be in the sides, the front, the back, they could be anywhere. On wow. a can, they are usually around the side of the can. So by just spinning the can in front of the camera, mm -hmm. that can be very helpful. The distance that you have from the camera um, is usually oops. the most important part. So if you keep that can at about six or seven inches, that would probably work pretty well. Um, mm -hmm. But you can practice to see what feels best. For some students, it might be easier to keep the can on a shelf so you don't have to hold the can in your hand so that the can's on the shelf, even like a shelf at a grocery store, and you spin the can, turning it, so that it's in front of you, um, mm -hmm. and the camera stays fixed in one spot, but by turning the can, it allows you to see different sides of the can. Thank huh. you, uh, Veronica, for your questions. We're gonna mute you again, because there are so many people on here. We unfortunately don't have the time to get take everybody's questions. Um, okay. By, by asking them, but thank you for asking what you asked. We've had some comments of things people like, tap, tap, see, be specular. Uh, somebody has also, Dustin's mentioned for Android, Google makes one similar to seeing AI called Lookout. Um, people are excited about practicing with these apps. So if you're able to type something into the chat box, that's the easiest for us because then Chris can keep going with his presentation and we'll pause um, every once in a while to ask for general questions. Thank you. And thank you very much everyone for contributing and sharing your experience. That's just awesome. Um, what I'm going to do now is we're going to go on to the next slide. The other one that we hadn't mentioned on this slide is Ira, which is a little different. That one, instead of working with a volunteer, you're working with a professional, but we'll get to some of that coming up here on this slide. Crowdsourced apps, like Be My Eyes and Be Specular. And just as a side note, um, you can, when you open these apps, you sign up either to be helped or to be a helper. So uh, just as an example, um, you may be seeking to get help with things. You would sign up as a person wanting to receive assistance and someone who, uh, in the case of Veronica's uncle, might be a helper. And that would be the way that you would sign up. You both see different screens the helpers get called when the app sends out the request from the person seeking help. So you can use these apps either as a volunteer or as a person seeking help. They will match you with a volunteer helper and the, the amount of calls is unlimited. You can ask all the questions you want. Ira matches you with a professional helper. The first five minutes of each call are free. There are some stores, grocery stores, uh, even airports uh, where you could be in the, anywhere in the airport, whether you were at the food, the food court or looking for your gate, and have a live agent share your camera with you so that wherever you point your camera, they can see what the camera sees. They can, uh, for instance, at the airport, tell you where, uh, where you are in the airport, what gate number you're close to. 
Um, if you were trying to find a product on a shelf at the grocery store, they could help to direct you to find the chicken noodle soup instead of the cream of tomato soup. Um, lots of different ways that an IRA agent or a crowdsourced volunteer can help you. Um, I'm gonna move through these a little more quickly just so that we can move along the slides. Um, if we don't get to your question, I'm gonna ask that if you still have a question, uh, we will be looking for ways for you to provide um, those questions. It might be through a channel that um, our, our hosts uh, set up for us, or um, I might have the host send out my email address so you can send that question. We'll find out what works best, but we'll try to find a way to get all your questions answered. Um, the AI apps, such as Seeing AI, are able to help you in lots of situations. Uh, it doesn't matter what time of the day or night it is. You can even ask the same question many times. Sometimes students are a little unsure about asking questions because they feel that they might have um, reached an adult's frustration tolerance. Um, and so it's important to remember that you can ask these apps question, the same question as many times as you want. It could be, what color are my socks? And uh, if you want to ask that 50 times, it's OK. So please remember to think about how you ask questions of those that you're helping, or those that are helping you, make sure you ask in ways that will get you the answers you can use. So for example, if you walked into uh, uh, a Walmart and, or a Target and you were asking someone, where's the bathroom? And they might just point and say, it's over there. And that might not be information that is accessible to you. If you ask that question, phrasing your question, is the bathroom to my right or my left, they will respond with whatever you give them because you have framed your question in such a way you help them to know how to respond. So let's try the process um, with one of the examples given earlier. So instead of doing some of our easy things like uh, looking at cans, we're going to go to a little bit more stressful situation. Here's the situation. I'm lost. I'm going to guess that, um, well, at least in my life, I know I've been lost before and, and it was kind of scary. Nowadays, I actually enjoy, when, I, when I'm not in a hurry, I actually enjoy being lost because of the things that I can find. So sometimes we can come to enjoy the things that used to be what we considered a problem. What's the first thing to do? Does anybody remember what was number one on our list? I'm going to pause for a minute, see if anybody comes up with it in the chat list. Stay calm, it's from Kelly oh. Hamburg. Yeah, a lot of Hooray. people are stay calm. Excellent, you all remember, good. So what is staying calm going, going to do to help us get on loss? Can anybody think of what staying calm can help us to do? Help us problem solve, good. not make us angry. Very good. When, when we're calm, we can think clearly. That's terrific. Excellent. So when you're, when you're lost, you need to ask yourself some questions that might help to bring you back to a place of being calm. Am I worried about being late? Am I worried about my safety? Is getting lost my only or most pressing problem? It might be that, um, let's just say that there's a torrential downpour with lightning and thunder and a tornado warning. Being lost at that moment isn't the big problem. The big problem is getting to a place that's safe while the storm passes. So there's lots of different ways at looking at this. If we're frightened, it can be very difficult for us to think clearly. So staying calm can help us to find the most important problem to solve first. Once I know which problem I'm trying to solve first, what are some possible options for solving the problem? So in this scenario of being lost, what types of things could we do? Anybody think of those? Uh, take deep breaths. Very good. Safe, uh, safety first. Good. Stop and listen. Excellent. Ask for help. Terrific. Evaluate your surroundings. Use cell phone to call for help. You guys are amazing. These settle down. So you're, you're already generating ideas. If you can't generate ideas, 
Um, there might be some people that you admire, some role models. Can you think of what they would do in the same situation? Maybe your parents are terrific at problem solving and you might think, well, what would mom or dad do in this type of situation? What would my teacher do? What would the O&M specialist tell me to do? So here are some possible options of what to do. Retrace your steps from your best recollection. Use your senses, auditory to listen for nearby streets, tactile and visual for landmarks you might remember or the location of the sun, proprioceptive, feeling where those slopes and hills are. You might solicit some assistance, asking people uh, for quest uh, questions for assistance. Um, are you feeling comfortable with asking these people? Is it safe? What questions might you ask? I'm gonna kind of move through these rather than pausing because I think we just have a couple of minutes left. Technology can also help you. You can ask Siri or OK Google, where am I? You could use the Be My Eyes or Ira or FaceTime to kind of connect with others so that they could provide some input from your phone's camera. You can share your location with a trusted adult using Apple Maps or Google Maps. We were gonna have an example of this with technology, but we can um, or try to find a way to share that information out maybe when we move along a little bit with the Excel program and we're able to uh, share some additional resources, but through either app, uh, Google Maps or Apple Maps, you can share your location so someone who is trying to help you or to find you can do that. So the best way to develop skills is to practice using them. Just like learning to play an instrument, the more you practice, the better you get. There will be mistakes. We all make mistakes and it's how we grow and learn. As we reflect on how things went, whether initial failures or successes, we learn for the next problem. Problem solving just could just become your superpower. So that's all we've got for this problem solving activity. I think we've got two minutes. Are there any questions that anybody has? Well, that was great, Chris. And we have Sonia Nima has her hand raised. If Leanne could unmute her. Don, Sonia. You get to turn on your mic, Sonia. I've made it so you can. There, I think that, can we unmute her, Leanne? She is on, it, uh, I can uh, unmute her, but only if she's turned on her mic, which she hasn't done yet. I see. There we go. There, Sonia. So my question was two of them. Firstly, the Be My Eyes app, could it be similar to the app of KNFB Reader, which could read you like print pages that are not braille? So the Seeing AI app is much more similar to KNFB Reader, which is a text-to-speech app. There are several text-to-speech apps that you can use. The difference with, I think you said the Be My Eyes, is that Be My Eyes is an actual live person who would be helping you. In seeing AI, it's what we call artificial intelligence, which is much more similar to KNFB Reader. At the moment, KNFB Reader can describe or, or use text to give you speech from that to read the document. Seeing AI includes some other things that it can do uh, as well. And secondly, I was going to ask that, could you use the Be My Eyes app or Ira like during school, say if you, get lost and I usually get disoriented quite often, but if you get lost and you're late for class and you want to access and you want to go independently to class, then could you use the Be My Eyes app or IRA? That way they can give it's, you directions to get to class. It's, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be very cautious here. It's possible that they can help you because they can read the, new, the room numbers or the hallway names. Some schools have hallways that are named or colored to help orient. Um, the challenge is that we have some rules about using smartphones and they're different for every school. So the app itself and what the app does could help you, but whether that's allowed at your school is something I don't know because I don't know the rules at your school. <laughs> So you'd want, to, you'd want to make sure to check with your teachers, and that might be something where you could talk with your IEP team to see if that's something that could be added as a permission for you to help you to be more independent. 
Chris, we have one more question and then we're going to have to stop for today. But our last question is, is there an app that can read Braille? At the moment, I, I, there, there very well might be, but I'm not thinking of one that will take a picture of Braille and transcribe it. It's a very possible that that is available, but I don't know of one off the top of my head. But it's an excellent question. Well, we just want to thank Chris so much for joining us today. Chris, we're going to have to um, print out and save this chat box because you have so many compliments in here. I could, we don't have long enough to read them all to you. Um, I'd also like to thank everybody for coming. And Leanne has written in the chat box that your name and email that was used to register will be sent a certificate of attendance and a satisfaction survey uh, later today. Please fill it out and let us know um, how we can plan for next time and how we can improve. And I think that would also be the best place to put your question because uh, if you have any questions, put them in there and I will get in touch with Chris and we'll make sure that those questions get compiled and put together. So uh, again, this is going to be recorded and posted on the Paths to Literacy website. Um, lots of people are missing your jokes, Chris, and there was a lot of <laughs> laughter and things in the chat box around that. Uh, Cheryl and Leanne, do you have anything else to say before we uh, sign off? Thank you everyone for joining us. I also wanted to remind you to keep checking the Paths to Literacy site. We are signed up for the next two weeks and we're really excited. We're working on week three. There are, there is a schedule posted and you can click on it. It will go directly to your Google Calendar. So you also have that feature to add that into your own calendars. Tomorrow, we're really excited to feature a two-part lesson. Robin Keating Clark will be presenting on Do I Detect Sarcasm? So we hope to see you tomorrow. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Thank everyone. you so much. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Chris. We love you. Thank you all. Thank you, Charlotte. <laughs> thank you, thank Chris, you, so much. You did thank wonderful. You, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.